Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar to talk about an ICC proposal for an outcome-based uh, compliance path. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, joining us today uh, to learn a little bit more. Uh, my name is Ryan Kolker. I'm Presidential Advisor here at the National Institute of Building Sciences. I'm going to provide a brief uh, introduction to uh, the Institute and then our interest in an outcome-based uh, pathway. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mike Fowler with Methune to give us an idea of uh, why designers in particular would be interested in this approach. And then I'll turn it over to Kendra Tupper from the City of Boulder to talk about uh, why a city would be particularly interested in an outcome-based approach. Uh, and then I will dive into the details around uh, the specific proposal that we have before the International Energy Conservation Code, uh, which will be heard uh, later this month. Uh, if you do have questions, please enter them in the chat box, which is provided on your screen, uh, and we will try to get to your questions at the end. Um, but first, uh, let me give you uh, a quick sense of uh, the Institute and why we are you know, particularly interested in an outcome-based pathway. The Institute itself was actually established by the U.S. Congress in 1974 to work across the public and private sector to improve buildings. Uh, under that mandate, the Institute works in four general areas, and the one I think most applicable uh, to today is the first one uh, that you see on your screen. Developing and maintaining performance criteria for maintenance of life, safety, health, and public welfare for the built environment. So the Institute is actually mandated to be engaged in the codes and standards process and to advance uh, codes and standards to improve the built environment. Uh, in recent years, we have become particularly interested in addressing the actual uh, performance of buildings and seeing how we can meet some of the goals that are going on uh, within our industry. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to Mike Fowler, who is an architect at Mithun in Seattle. He has over 25 years of experience on award-winning projects, including two net zero energy designs and over a dozen LEED certified buildings. He has served on two technical advisory groups for the Washington State Building Code Council, including Energy Code and Green Building Code. He has chaired the Codes and Planning Policy Committee for AIA Washington. And in 2011 through 2013, he stepped away from architecture to manage the multifamily new construction and residential new construction energy efficiency financial incentive program at Puget Sound Energy. There he created the first whole building residential measure with an incentive for for predicted low energy use design and a bonus incentive for actual metered energy use hitting the design target range. Mike has authored and submitted a peer-reviewed outcome-based energy budget code proposal to the state of Washington. Sounds good. Thank you, Ryan. Hopefully everybody can hear me just fine. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, I'm an architect and I've been an advocate for an outcome-based path over the past two code cycles here in Washington State. And I just want to say thank you to Ryan and the National Institute of Building Sciences uh, for hosting this webinar here today. I like this outcome word cloud that you have in front of you on the screen because outcome-based codes are sometimes they're viewed as a complex jumble of ideas and words that we recognize, but at this point we don't fully understand yet how it all fits together. It is something that's totally new. It's completely different than how we approach codes currently. And this can make it a little bit mysterious and cause some concern or some caution. Uh, but today I want to share with you how I view uh, the outcome-based code path, what it can mean from a development team perspective, and show how an outcome-based code can become a clear, simple path for delivering high-performance buildings. Next, I'm going to do a quick comparison between the current code compliance prescriptive-based path and an outcome-based code path. From a design and development team perspective, this is my view of how the prescriptive code path feels as a long checklist of what you must do. And in this example, I put it in the context of how a code, prescriptive code might tell you how to get ready for a meeting at 9 o'clock this morning or tomorrow morning. Uh, in this scenario, uh, the development team would focus all of its energy 
on meeting this checklist. And the reason we focus all of our energy on this checklist is because this 9 o'clock meeting that we have tomorrow morning is with the code official to review this actual checklist. Did you have breakfast today? Yes? Okay, check. Did you follow the prescribed walking path to get here? Yes? Check mark? Okay. And um, we'll say now that you, you fully comply with the checklist and now you comply with the energy code. Well, let's say my project, I have a measure that I want to do that's a little bit different. It doesn't match up with this prescriptive code. Uh, let's say I, uh, instead I want to have some waffles, sausage, and juice instead of eggs, bacon, and coffee. And that's okay within our current code system, but in order to do that, we now need to create a computer model of this desired option or proposed option, and then we also need to compare it to another computer model that has our two eggs, bacon, and coffee as the baseline. And while you're doing your proposed model, let's not forget we need to also show how this proposal will have 13% less calories to be deemed equivalent to the baseline code model. On the right-hand side is how a performance outcome-based path would work. And it's much more simple and gives you a target to hit. And it just, for this context, would be you have a meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m., arrive, show up, and be prepared. And that puts the onus on the development team to do their homework and come and deliver a design that will meet a performance level. So in an outcome-based code, what this does now is we can have the development team focus all of its energy on what the final result will be and not look at what it is, how does this compare to a prescriptive theoretical baseline. So in this example, I looked at my own local zone 4C uh, for a, an administrative professional office building and see that it has a site EUI of 86. And so that is my energy budget maximum that I now need to design to. Like I said, now I don't have to spend time, money, effort on creating a prescriptive baseline code. I can instead turn all of our design team focus towards decisions that will meet this number, conserve energy, and reduce energy use. So now that we have our target number of 86, this is typically the point where a lot of the members of a development team will get nervous. Okay, I have an actual number that I have to hit in real life. But I want to say there's no need to panic. Instead, we, if we can keep the development team calm, because this is an opportunity to optimize the design and our building performance. And what I like as an architect with deep energy conservation goals is that an outcome-based approach provides a greater emphasis to invest in what items the design team can control about energy use. And to me, that is specifically the building enclosure. I think if you focus on the building enclosure, the approach will do the vast majority of the heavy lifting in terms of meeting an energy performance goal. There's variations in the weather from year to year, and that does occur, but if a project team will make a concerted effort to design an energy efficient building form with proper shading, install excellent levels of building insulation and windows, along with having excellent building air tightness, the energy use for heating and cooling demand can become very predictable. What I also like also is that this outcome approach will force, I think, construction details and construction installation to become better. Reducing air tightness or uh, getting better levels of air tightness, reducing thermal bridges in our, on our, our envelope walls, critical and important in a high-performance building envelope. But if a team does not pay attention to this, these critical items, then adding ever-increasing higher levels of prescriptive insulation becomes a complete waste of project team money. I think if we design more effective overall wall U values without thermal bridges, this opens the door for a great cost optimization effort that we can use that savings to, to
trade off elsewhere in the building. And that puts a whole lot of control and, and, and emphasis in the design team's court to, to find these solutions. What I also like about having this focus on the building envelope is uh, it's the primary step, I think, that will be needed to achieve actual energy use performance levels. And investing in our building envelopes is, I think, the best long-term investment a team can make and our society can make. Because once we have buildings that are built, any possible renovation on the building enclosure is highly unlikely for at least the next 50 years. In our current code, we can easily swap out a less efficient building envelope for more efficient lighting and mechanical equipment. And these pieces of, of, of high-tech lighting and mechanical equipment, these are items that are easily swapped out for more efficient models that may come down the line when these run their course of 10 to 20 year lifespans. So now we're faced with the energy meter. The big moment of truth, does our design perform how we believe it will? And again, this is a moment for design teams to keep calm uh, because the development team has already gone through and taken the necessary steps that they can do to gain the highest level of confidence possible that this building will perform as designed and meets design energy target. And for me, proving that the design delivers on energy performance is, is absolutely the best part of this. Uh, when we have building owners here that choose not to share their energy use data, uh, it's frustrating because I don't get a chance to learn how did the building perform. Uh, that's a very frustrating part of my work. Uh, to me, I view this similar to it's football season. Uh, if we, this, there was a decree that this weekend we're going to cancel every single football game and not play them. Uh, instead, we're going to alter the standings and declare the winner based on who was favored prior going into the game. Uh, when not determine who is the winner on the field. Uh, I'm a former athlete. I love to play in big games and I love to compete. And as a designer, and I hope that's where we can push our design community, is to wanting to do the similar thing, to actually prove the results in the case of our buildings in the field. And another thing I like about outcome-based energy codes is it, do it has, an, has an absolute number. And so when we look at future going from the 2018 to the 2021, uh, IECC, updating these numbers just becomes a simple number change. Uh, we don't have to go into extensive debating and lobbying and code hearings to hash out whether roof insulation should be improved by another R2 or R6 prescriptively. Um, we can determine what is the percentage that the energy code should improve for the next cycle. And if we determine that we should meet our national energy efficiency goals, we should have a 15% improvement of energy performance in the 2021 code. Our 86 number then becomes a 73 number, and that is the number that future design teams will put all their efforts in towards meeting. So I'm hoping that a few of these uh, non-typical analogies and descriptions help explain the outcome-based compliance path, uh, that they don't need to be viewed as overly complex, and that you'll start to view, start to view the outcome-based path as an energy code solution that will deliver measurable results. And that's the big points that I wanted to hit on today. Uh, thanks, Ryan. Uh, I want to thank everybody who, who phoned in to listen to this webinar. Uh, if you're ever in Seattle, uh, drop me an email. I'm always up for discussing outcome-based energy codes over a cup of coffee. Thanks, Ryan. Great. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to Kendra Tupper, who is a licensed mechanical engineer and is currently serving as the Energy Services Manager for the City of Boulder. In that role, she manages the efficiency and renewable programs offered by the city, including voluntary rebate programs such as Energy Smart, as well as mandatory efforts required by regulation. She is currently working on the long-term strategy for the city's energy codes to reach net zero by 2031 and is exploring innovative energy services that Boulder might offer as a municipal electric utility. Prior to joining the city, Kendra was a principal at Rocky Mountain Institute, leading the building practices team. Let me get your presentation up, Kendra, and then we can uh, get started. Um, great. So um, Mike has touched on this already a little bit, um, but when we think about energy codes, um, there are the mandatory requirements that 
folks have to meet regardless of the pathway that they're choosing for prescriptive versus performance. Um, and that's sort of the fork in the road where you typically have a choice of either doing a whole building energy model where you can make trade-offs or choosing to meet a prescriptive code which meets all kind of the checklist requirements that Mike laid out. Um, the outcome-based code I think of a little bit as an add-on to that performance path because there still is a whole building energy model that you have to meet, but the requirement really then becomes based on post-occupancy energy consumption. And that, for the city of Boulder, is really why we're so interested in outcome-based codes. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit more, but we can go to the next slide, Ryan. You can go to the next slide. Um, Thank you. So the city of Boulder has um, some pretty aggressive goals for sustainability and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have a target of reducing our overall greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050, and that's compared to a 2005 baseline. Um, and the interesting thing is that when we started doing models to see how we could actually achieve that goal, other than changing our electricity supply from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy, the single most impactful program that we had to get us to that target was um, getting to net zero energy codes, um, both for renovations and new construction. And so as Ryan mentioned, the city of Boulder has a target that by the year 2031, all buildings um, will be under a net zero energy code. We're already starting to require that um, starting next year for the largest residential home sizes, greater than 5,000 square feet. Um, and we expect to phase in other home sizes before 2031 and phase in some of the um, lower energy intensity commercial buildings before 2031 as well. And when we say net zero energy, um, we basically mean that the renewable energy production will be equal to or exceed the annual site energy consumption. Um, of the building. And we are exploring um, the possibility of allowing participation in community solar to count um, for this as well if um, the building has exhausted all of the efficiency and on-site renewable options to meet this target. Um, so again, this is our definition of net zero energy. And what we're showing now is kind of how we envision um, our energy codes playing out out to that deadline of 2031. And so right now, today, what we're seeing for commercial buildings is that just to meet our energy code today, the majority of buildings are needing on-site renewables um, just to get to our code. We anticipate that um, as the code becomes more stringent in into the 2020s, um, that proportion of on-site renewables is gonna have to increase. And when we get to 2031, um, in order to actually hit net zero, there's going to have to be a combination of reducing your energy consumption, obviously, maximizing the on-site renewables, and then purchasing into off-site community solar because they're simply high, intense, high energy intensity commercial buildings like hospitals, data centers, et cetera, that could never realistically meet net zero on-site. Um, next slide. And so... We have um, a number of key components for kind of our long-term strategy out to 2031. How do we get from where we are today, which is our current commercial energy code, is that um, commercial buildings have to perform 30% better than IECC 2012, which is, um, to my knowledge, the most aggressive commercial energy code in the country. How do we get from where we are today to actual net zero buildings performing net zero in the field by 2031. And so there's a number of things that we're going to phase in along the way. Um, the first is what we've um, just talked about, allowing offsite community solar and potentially approved carbon offset funds to count for code compliance only when on-site is infeasible. And that would likely be phased in um, as soon as 2019, probably. First for residential, when those will be required to be net zero before the commercial buildings. Um, we're also looking at, um, as we're moving forward, 
although renewables can count to complying with the performance or outcome-based path of an energy code, we want to require a base level of efficiency before renewables. And so um, one way that could look is um, on the residential side with a HERS rating or an ERI rating, if you have a target um, of 60 overall, or sorry, 40 overall, maybe you require that um, that house has to hit an ERI of 50 before they're allowed to take credit for renewables. And similarly, if you have an office building where the EUI must hit, um, you know, an e it can't exceed an EUI of 70, perhaps the building can't exceed an EUI of 80 um, and before renewables as well. And then, um, of course, outcome-based codes is a big part of our long-term strategy. We hope to pilot a voluntary outcome-based energy code starting as soon as 2019, where this would be tied to actual measured energy consumption of the building post-occupancy. Um, you can go to the next slide. The other key components of our long-term strategy um, is to start phasing in IGCC requirements for commercial buildings. So right now, the city of Boulder has a lot of local building code language um, with amendments that address a lot of non-energy sustainability requirements. Um, but we'd like to adopt um, sections of the National Green Building Code to replace those sort of customized homegrown amendments that we've made over time now that there um, is code language for that. We're also looking at providing early adopter incentives for buildings to be net zero before it's required by code and also adopting code amendments or incentives over time to encourage all electric buildings and discourage the installation of natural gas equipment. Um, we see this as a really important step in getting to net zero buildings, um, is avoiding the purchase and installation of kind of locking yourself into large capital expenditures of natural gas equipment when there's no renewable alternative for that natural gas source. Um, so those are all things that we're exploring long term. Um, but to talk a little bit more about outcome-based codes, we can go to the next slide. And so, again, I, I mentioned this before. Today we're at our commercial energy code is 30% better than IECC 2012. How do we get to where we want to be, which is net zero in the field actually performing? And the reason why we're so drawn to outcome-based codes is because it verifies actual energy performance. And the compliance is contingent upon demonstrating that an occupied building's energy actually meets or exceeds that specific performance target, um, the EUI target that Mike had talked about. And this is really important to the city of Boulder because even though we have one of the most stringent energy codes, what we've seen is that even though the buildings are meeting the energy code through their whole building modeling, when we're actually um, gathering data about how they perform in the field, the numbers are very, very different. And so um, one example of that is um, last year we passed the building performance ordinance, which um, actually, if you can go to the next slide, Ryan, I'm kind of jumping ahead. But um, so this is uh, last year we passed the building performance ordinance, which requires large commercial and industrial buildings to rate and report building energy use and then implement energy efficiency over time. And so what it's allowed us to do um, just this year private sector, commercial and industrial buildings larger than 50,000 square feet had to comply first, and they've submitted their energy use through Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So we have a pretty rich data set now of how our, that building stock is actually performing in terms of energy use intensity in the field. And we've pulled out some of the buildings that were relatively new buildings, you know, built in the last five or ten years. And we looked at, you know, when they submitted for their permit, what was the estimated energy use intensity, and then how does that compare to how they're actually performing in the field? And what we're seeing, um, not in all cases, but in some cases, it can be um, greatly, greatly different than what the energy model predicted. One example is um, a hotel that was constructed in 2008, and it, was, um, it had to be compliant at the time, with 30% better than IECC 2006. Um, and so they did the energy model. It looked like it was going to be a great building that was performing wonderfully. Um, and then it went through this building performance ordinance program 
rated and reported its energy use through Portfolio Manager, and it got an Energy Star score of 1, which, um, as I'm sure you know, is the worst possible score that you can get in the Energy Star metric. And so the and the energy use intensity is three times what the model predicted. And so I think it's just it's reinforcing um, our belief that these whole building energy models and performance based codes, while well intentioned, of course cannot guarantee how a building is going to perform in the field, and we might not be actually getting what we what we think we're getting. Um, the other reason why we're really drawn to outcome based codes is that it does eliminate the baseline energy model. And so it gets away from this whole percent better than a reference building that's designed by code, which is pretty easy to game the system in some ways and create a model that will comply with the target you have to hit. Um, instead, if you have an energy use intensity target that you have to meet, you simply have to create an energy model of how your building is actually going to be designed and operated. Um, including all of the energy use in the building, not just the regulated loads. And so that's the other reason why the city of Boulder is really drawn to this approach. Um, next slide. Um, in terms of next steps and thinking about moving towards this pilot program in 2019, um, the things that we're working on right now is determining the EUI targets by building types. Um, while there, is, there are some EUI targets that are out there in draft versions of IGCC and IECC, they're, um, they're not stringent enough for the city of Boulder, and so we would be kind of modifying them um, and creating our own EUI targets. Also figuring out how to handle industrial and process-driven buildings, which you really cannot set an EUI target for. Um, figuring out um, launching the pilot program and then Determining the best practices for enforcement, um, whether that's temporary certificates of occupancy, um, and then tying our enforcement somehow to our building performance ordinance program that's already collecting uh, energy use data in the field. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up so that we have some time for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Kendra. And we do have uh, some questions, but we will you will uh, get to those shortly. Uh, I'm going to wrap up with uh, a little bit of uh, details on the specific proposal we have uh, before the IECC. Uh, again, I'm Ryan Kolker, uh, Presidential Advisor here at the National Institute of Building Sciences, and Kendra and Mike certainly set up uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that um, we're looking to uh, utilize, you know, through implementation of, of outcome-based uh, processes within codes, but I'm going to quickly kind of go through uh, some of the things that we've seen and, again, you know, why we're particularly interested in uh, an outcome-based process. So I think first we need to take a step back and take a look at um, where we are today relative to energy codes. And I think, you know, many uh, folks seem to indicate that, uh, you know, within code departments, uh, energy codes and green codes in general, you know, tend to fall into uh, kind of second tier uh, priorities, uh, despite some of the things that are going on at um, the, you know, within the leadership of uh, cities uh, and states relative to achieving, um, say, net zero energy building goals or greenhouse gas emission reduction goals or even, uh, you know, implementing um, clean power uh, plan goals or anything like that. So, you know, there's this overall perception that it's not health, safety, and welfare. And we can certainly have, you know, the discussion as to why it is, but, you know, that's the perception out there. Uh, we're also seeing um, some challenges within code departments themselves about the availability of staff, of funding, of technical resources. Uh, we did a, a survey of code officials uh, not too long ago uh, and found that 80% are retiring within the next 15 years, 30% uh, within the next five and most departments are nine people or less. So anything that we can do to help uh, facilitate or overcome uh, those limited resources is certainly uh, an opportunity. Generally, you know, compliance with energy codes uh, is thought to be low. I know there has been some efforts uh, within uh, Department of Energy to look at um, actual compliance, but I think it points to uh, specific prescriptive type requirements, uh, and so those are easily verified, and, and as Kendra mentioned, may not actually result in uh, the energy performance that we were intending. 
Uh, I think one of the big things around uh, energy codes themselves is that they're design focused. Uh, again, the intended result uh, is actual achievement in uh, energy performance, but they, that may not necessarily be what you get. Uh, it ends at occupancy, yet operations is a key factor in actually determining uh, how energy is used, and particularly the disconnect between the design focus of codes and the operational uh, utilization of energy is something that uh, most policymakers uh, don't really understand. So, you know, thinking about uh, how codes are developed today, they're typically a component-by-component -component strategy. Uh, which tends to limit the opportunity to uh, utilize uh, system level efficiency, uh, identify synergistic effects, uh, and also you know, capture some of the energy uh, uses or influencers that are not currently covered within code uh, and may not easily be covered within code. Uh, building in orientation for one uh, is, is not very easily uh, you know, recognized within code. And for folks that have participated within the code development process, uh, often material interests drive the process. As Mike mentioned, uh, it's much easier to just uh, set a target and adjust the target uh, throughout the, the code cycles rather than, um, you know, discuss whether, you know, we need an additional level of insulation and what kind of insulation it should be and, and those kinds of things. And ultimately, the uh, requirements within the code may not necessarily be the most cost-efficient strategies to actually achieve the energy savings that we're looking for. So I think, you know, we've certainly made uh, great progress uh, within codes, but I think the important thing, and, and Kendra certainly uh, pointed this out, is that, you know, your actual results may vary. And if we're looking at addressing uh, zero energy building goals or greenhouse gas emission goals or whatever your particular goals are, um, you know, we're looking for an actual uh, measure of result. So in thinking about kind of what drives energy outcomes, uh, you know, we certainly have the design, which sets up the foundation for achieving uh, an energy performance level. We also have operating characteristics and tenant behavior. So in code, we've done a great job thus far of ratcheting down uh, requirements to really get to uh, the design side. We haven't done a great job of tackling the, out the operating characteristics and the tenant behavior, which at this point is really a significant driver of uh, energy performance. So we've started to think about how do we move forward relative to a uh, strategy uh, within code, but then also within a broader framework, uh, much like Kendra discussed relative to what's going on with Boulder. Uh, we've seen uh, an optimization of individual uh, pieces of equipment. We've seen optimization of methodologies. Uh, within our own individual disciplines, we've kind of developed strategies, but we now need to think about how do we bring that all together to really drive towards a high-performance building that integrates and optimizes multiple attributes. So it's not just about energy, it's about resilience, it's about uh, accessibility. And so it, it's becoming increasingly complex, but, you know, there are strategies to be able to optimize all of those and putting them in a way that we can really uh, address uh, the performance. And as we start to think about, you know, life cycle performance uh, across the building, recognizing the gap that we currently have uh, between the design and construction process and the operations process. So I mentioned a, a need for a, a comprehensive strategy based off of collaborative approaches uh, that leads us to the achievement of performance goals that are occurring at an industry level, uh, at a community level, at an owner level, and at a project level. So both Kendra and Mike talked about uh, prescriptive and performance codes, which are the main uh, avenues that we have for compliance with the energy code today. Um, I think, you know, Mike's analogy uh, relative to, you know, what you do in the morning to prepare for your day uh, certainly fits uh, well, uh, you know, with the uh, explanation. But I think, you know, the, the key differentiator between uh, prescriptive and performance codes and an outcome-based uh, code pathway is the actual achievement of measured performance. So in thinking generally about outcome-based codes, it's really about establishing a target energy use level and then having measurement and reporting to assure that you've actually achieved that level. It would include all energy uses. Uh, as Mike mentioned, it would provide flexibility for the design team. You would actually have uh, measured results. 
Uh, and then, you know, one of the key uh, benefits is really being able to recognize the diversity across building types. So even existing buildings and historic buildings, uh, the design team and the owner can make the choices that best fit with the existing structure of that building, and the community can be assured that there's actually a uh, level of achievement of uh, energy performance uh, in line with the intent of the code. So in thinking about kind of what a, a target uh, is, uh, we've identified a few uh, specific uh, outcomes, I guess somewhat pun intended, uh, to really achieve uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve. So I think the optional nature uh, is, is certainly a key aspect of this. Uh, you know, at this point, an outcome-based uh, process would be uh, alongside the current prescriptive and performance process. Uh, so those would still uh, remain. Uh, it would be flexible uh, for the design team and the owner. It would provide actual measured results. Uh, you would base those results off of uh, utility bills. Uh, it would be effective in making sure that uh, policies are actually being met and reducing uh, some of the challenges that we've seen uh, within code departments. And then ultimately, it's about the achievement of results. So we've already seen uh, outcome-based uh, provisions uh, appear in some codes. Uh, so you have a, a Seattle target performance path, uh, and then there is a provision within the 2015 International Green Construction Code, and we're currently in the process of uh, working with ASHRAE 189.1 to uh, see about including the process or a similar process to what's in the IGCC uh, within 189.1. So let me specifically dive into uh, proposal CE37 uh, for the International uh, Energy Conservation Code, uh, which will be held uh, in a couple weeks uh, in Kansas City. Uh, the development process itself involved a multi-stakeholder effort to engage owners, designers, manufacturers, code officials, advocates, and others to really work through uh, developing the proposal. The proposal itself, uh, based off of the public comment we've submitted, offers an addendum or a, uh, appendix to the commercial provisions of the 2018 IECC. So it would provide a mechanism for uh, folks to uh, pick up uh, a methodology uh, for implementation uh, of an outcome-based pathway. Uh, you know, Kendra mentioned the interest of uh, initiating a pilot program in 2019. Uh, within Boulder, so this could certainly be something that they would look to uh, as a potential uh, means to uh, start their own, uh, you know, particular pilot program. And then as far as the development of the targets themselves, uh, they're based on a uh, methodology in ASHRAE Standard 100, uh, based on a technical basis uh, conducted by Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, the EUI targets themselves are a 5.5% improvement over standard 90.1 2013, which is about uh, what we feel would be in line with uh, the potential end result of uh, the overall IECC uh, hearing. So let me actually dive into um, the meat of the proposal and how it actually operates. So one of the fundamental things about an outcome-based uh, pathway is setting an energy use target. Uh, so uh, CE 37, uh, sets up that target uh, within tables uh, for uh, various different building types and uh, climate zones. Uh, it does have uh, the capability of adjusting for heating degree days if the uh, jurisdiction within that climate zone is uh, not, you know, necessarily uh, equivalent to the reference city uh, that that climate zone is based off of. So that methodology is there. The design team uh, would then demonstrate that they have the capability to meet that target, either through going through a modeling process uh, where they model the building to achieve uh, the designated EUI, uh, or they go through a uh, pre-approved prescriptive approach process. Uh, that's something that could be developed um, within the future where, say, for instance, for uh, small or replicable buildings, there could be a uh, set of prescriptive options that actually come out of uh, an outcome-based approach. And then the uh, inspector would actually take the results from uh, that model or from the prescriptive package and verify that those components are actually uh, within the building and that things are, you know, installed correctly and those sorts of things. At that point, uh, 
uh, once the inspector is satisfied uh, a, and the uh, you know, construction is complete, a temporary certificate of occupancy or a post-occupancy verification permit would be issued. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, the post-occupancy verification uh, permit uh, a little bit more in a minute. Uh, at that point, uh, you know, the owner would be on the hook uh, to report their energy use. Uh, we have a 12-month uh, uh, energy use requirement uh, within two years. Uh, so that gives time for um, commissioning and just tenant education or whatever sorts of uh, things that the owner uh, needs to do to make sure that they can comply uh, with the target. Once compliance is determined uh, by submission of uh, energy bills, uh, a certificate of occupancy is issued uh, if the initial strategy was to issue a TCO uh, or the post-occupancy verification permit is closed. Um, if compliance is not met, uh, enforcement action can be undertaken, uh, and that would be at the uh, discretion of the uh, jurisdiction. We have not uh, indicated what you know, particular strategy uh, folks should employ, uh, but I will talk about that in a, in a moment because that's been one of the uh, key areas where folks have had uh, concern. So regarding compliance, I mentioned uh, either issuing a temporary certificate of occupancy or a post-occupancy verification permit. Uh, the owner would actually bear the burden of reporting their energy use uh, to resolve the TCO or the POVP. Again, I mentioned 12 months uh, of data uh, within two years. Uh, it needs to be certified by a registered design professional. And then, you know, the, certainly the owner has the motivation to uh, provide that information uh, as an open TCO or a POVP may hinder some financing, insurance, leasing, uh, sale or any other uh, sort of measures that they may be looking to uh, into the future. As I mentioned, uh, the penalties or the resolution are up to the uh, authority having jurisdiction. Um, you know, many folks ultimately jump to uh, the first thing that comes to their mind about, you know, shutting down the building and kicking people out, uh, which, you know, certainly recognize that that uh, is not going to happen, um, but that, you know, there may be opportunities for uh, implementation of uh, audit and retrofit requirements uh, to meet the requirements. Um, retro commissioning, uh, for instance, could be another strategy. Uh, so there are certainly things uh, that could be done uh, that would not, you know, rise to the level of extreme uh, that folks often want to jump to. And then, as Kendra mentioned, you know, it's really about thinking about broader policies and fitting in uh, an outcome-based uh, compliance path to really uh, realize some of the goals that uh, departments or cities are looking for. In the IGCC proposal, we introduced a new concept called the post-occupancy verification permit. It would be a permit that would be issued uh, before a certificate of occupancy that would remain open to address some of the requirements of the code that occur post-occupancy. So it allows the jurisdiction to issue the certificate of occupancy, but still have a means to address some of the ongoing requirements. In addition to an outcome-based uh, pathway, it could be used to facilitate other things like uh, commissioning, demand response requirements, uh, or even operation and maintenance uh, things. And again, it's you know, linking to other policies and programs. Uh, before we wrap up and get to some of your questions, um, I'm going to point out a, a few resources that folks may be interested in if they want to learn more uh, about outcome-based pathways uh, and outcome-based codes in particular. Uh, there's a resource on the whole building design guide that talks about uh, various different strategies, not just from a code perspective, but uh, thinking about contracting mechanisms uh, and other means that uh, owners may uh, be interested in. Uh, there are also resources through uh, New Buildings Institute uh, relative to their work on uh, outcome-based performance, uh, and certainly we've been working uh, together on uh, many of these different strategies. And then there are particular resources that are available uh, relative to uh, CE 37. Uh, we have an outcome-based compliance path fact sheet. Uh, and then we have uh, outcome-based compliance path FAQs. Uh, so if you're within a you know, particular area of the industry and want to see how an outcome-based pathway uh, would impact you, uh, you can take a look at uh, some of the frequently asked questions uh, there. Um, this is just a way to say codes are not the only uh, mechanism or means uh, that is required to advance 
towards outcome-focused goals. Uh, there are things like policies, incentives, uh, contracting mechanisms, and other things that we really need to look to uh, to really address uh, how we achieve uh, some of these goals. And I think one of the biggest things, uh, if you're able to, uh, certainly we look for your participation uh, in Kansas City at the, the hearings themselves, uh, and then voting through CDP access. So with that, uh, we will certainly uh, answer your questions. Uh, and um, Thank you for uh, participating. We have a few, um, so let me get uh, started, dive right in. Um, so Kendra, I think the first one is for you. Um, how, do you how do your greenhouse gas uh, reduction goals relate to uh, net zero energy buildings? Um, I have to pull up the model specifically. We have a pretty complex model that models projected reductions from all of our policies and voluntary programs, and then um, the uh, greening of the electricity supply over time, all the way out to 2020, uh, 2050. Sorry, and so I forget exactly what it is, but I think um, our energy codes probably get us about 10% of the way to that target. Um, honestly, about 60% of that target is coming from the uh, energy source, the electricity supply, switching that over to renewables. Um, but by far, energy codes had the biggest impact of any of the policy or voluntary efficiency programs. Great. Um, I think this one's actually for you as well, Kendra. You mentioned um, doing an EUI uh, calculation uh, for, for a uh, proposed building. At what point in the, the process does that actually get transmitted to, to the city? Is it before a building permit or after a building permit? Kind of what in the, where in the process does that fit? Yeah, so, um, so I guess there's, there's two things because you can do an EUI target as part of a performance code, or you can do an EUI target as part of an outcome-based code. And so I mentioned that we were thinking of piloting outcome-based codes in 2019. We're also thinking of moving away from um, percent better than baseline models in 2019 for our performance code and going straight to energy use intensity targets for our performance code in 2019. And so under the performance pathway, um, where you still do an energy model and your permit is just based on that model. You'd simply do an energy model. It would show that it hit the energy use intensity target that had been set by the city, and you would get your permit based on that. Um, if and when we move to outcome-based codes, um, that would be a, a little bit of a different process. You'd submit your energy model at the time of the permit showing the EUI, and you'd get a temporary permit or a temporary certificate of occupancy like Ryan mentioned, and then you wouldn't get the full permit or certificate of occupancy until you had submitted a year's worth of, of energy data showing that you were hitting that target in the field. Um, does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so we have a question on um, how an outcome-based pathway would treat uh, core and shell projects. Uh, I can certainly take the, the first crack at that. Uh, relative to uh, our proposal um, within the IECC, uh, it really wouldn't apply at this point. Um, you know, an outcome-based path uh, is really intended for uh, projects that uh, you know, would have a, an opportunity to engage uh, tenants and, and operations folks. Um, so you would still have the uh, prescriptive and performance path uh, to be able to achieve that. Um, so, you know, right now, uh, you know, as, as we begin to move forward on an outcome-based path, um, we're not really targeting uh, core and shell projects. Um, um, we have, at the City of Boulder, we have started to think about that a little bit, even with our code being 30% better than IECC 2012, and most of our submittals have been core and shell. Um, and we, you, you can't hit that unless you include the tenant areas, essentially. And so one of the things that we're um, proposing in the next code update is that you submit your energy code model for core and shell, and you are allowed to take credit for things um, on the tenant level, 
but you don't get your full permit until you submit the the tenant level improvement plans that show the improvements that you took credit for in your model are actually on the TI permit plans. Um, so that's how we're handling it for the performance path, and I could envision something similar for the outcome base. Great. Uh, this one, I, I think, you know, certainly Mike can take a crack at it, and then I will uh, take a crack at it as well. Uh, what reluctance are you seeing from designers who have no control over the operation of the facility, and how do you bridge the gap between design and construction and operations? Mike, you want to take a crack at that first, and then I'll uh, jump in? Uh, sure. Yeah, operations, it's uh, its the wild card. Uh, there's, no, there's no way to get around that. Um, but I think... Uh, that's why I would em that's why I emphasize on projects to really dive into measures that you can control, especially with the building envelope and the enclosure, reducing your heat and your hot water loads uh, dramatically um, will help provide a little bit of fluff cushion for how does somebody operate it. Um, uh, part of it's going to be um, how jurisdictions implement. Um, you know, if there's a pass-through method that the building owner is responsible, but if then the tenant becomes also responsible for that operation, uh, if the, if basically what I'm going to say is if, they, if the tenants have an op some skin in the game for how the building is operated, they're going to they're going to they're going to operate their building in a different manner than if they than they don't. Right. Yeah. That, that's certainly helpful. And you know, one of the things that um, we have seen is the establishment of uh, basically outcome-based targets for uh, individual projects, and you know, certainly there have been um, architecture firms, uh, design firms uh, that have you know gone off after those projects. Uh, there's actually a few case studies uh, on the whole building design guide. Uh, the the GSA Federal Center South project uh, in Seattle certainly uh, is one of those where uh, you know GSA set up an energy target um, and uh, provided incentives for the design team to actually achieve that. And one of the things that really drove the ability uh, for the, the design team to, um, you know, achieve the targets was a, uh, a well-written contract that actually laid out, you know, who was responsible for what, um, you know, what matters were under the control of um, the design team, what were under the control of uh, the facility itself, and then, uh, you know, parsing out how those uh, differentiators were actually uh, addressed. Um, and I think there's also a, a significant role for commissioning uh, in that process as well that, um, you know, would really demonstrate that um, the, the design and the construction have the capability of meeting uh, the targets and then, you know, potentially uh, giving the owner and the designer some assurance that uh, those targets could actually be met. Um, Question of whether where uh, enforcement would actually be uh, done, whether it's the designer or the owner. Uh, ultimately, from a, uh, a community perspective, uh, the enforcement would be with the owner. Uh, but you know, certainly the owner uh, would then actually you know engage uh, the designers to really address you know what the what the challenge was. Uh, and as Mike mentioned, one of the key uh, things that we're looking at is developing feedback loops to assure that, you know, we, we learn from past projects uh, and really understand, um, you know, what's working uh, and what's not. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, some successful businesses may use more energy than ordinary businesses. Either they make more product or sell more food or, or something like that. Uh, how would you account for that? Uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to take a crack at it, and then uh, Kendra, and then I can, um, you know, finish it up. Uh, that's, a come up, that's one that comes up often, say, uh, what, if, what if Starbucks goes in as one of the retail spaces? Uh, they, have, they do a high volume of business, therefore their energy use is going to be up compared to Somebody across the street, similar piece, is not as busy, is not going to use as much. Uh, I mean, there are some ways that 
even Kendra's talked about how, what Boulder is looking at and honing in on determining what is an appropriate level. Um, I think what will be coming into outcome-based code requirements is the opportunity for design teams as part of their modeling to say, here's what we're anticipating in terms of the occupant use. Here's a coffee shop that's going to, it's, it's not a, it's going to run from 5 a.m. to midnight. Uh, it's not a, it's not a post-launch or just a breakfast-only location um, that you can factor in and, and customize, tweak the EUI number so that if you do have a Starbucks in your location, your source EUI is not 86, it's 89. Or if you've got, I mean, folks are only going to do the ones that want to bump it up a touch. Um, but if you, if you, hey, if uh, um, I mean, there would be follow-up uh, commissioning levels, say Starbucks moves out, uh, somebody comes in with a lower energy use intensity, uh, I think there, needs, there will be a mechanism to adjust the EUI uh, based on tenants and who, who's, who's operating in, in the space. Great. Kendra, anything to add? Um, it's something we've been thinking about. There's obviously a methodology to adjust the EUI target based on the weather for a particular year, but there's not a great um, way to adjust it for different occupancy or, you know, process load intensity of what's going on in the building. And so, like Mike said, I think the city is thinking of handling that on a exception basis um, if, if someone is going through the process and feels like they warrant an ex exception from the current EUI targets that's been set and they can justify why, then we'd be willing to work with them on that. But for the most part, the EUIs are going to be set by building type. And so, you know, if we have an EUI for a coffee shop or um, a restaurant, those generally have pretty similar operating hours. Um, and so, if you're doing a higher volume and you're because you're a more successful coffee shop, then that might mean that you need to do a little bit more energy efficiency. Um, but we're not anticipating that there's going to be that much variation within the building types. Um, but we are open to considering exceptions if there are. Yeah, and the right. of knowing an EOI target number ahead of time as you start a project and you start designing is that you can make you can make the choices that will direct you and push you down to a lower energy use level to give yourself a little bit of cushion uh, based on tenant variation. Uh, but you have power in your choices up front um, to, to create lower energy use buildings, no matter who the tenant is. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that's uh, certainly a good uh, place to stop. Uh, Mike and Kendra, certainly uh, appreciate your uh, willingness to present today and talk about uh, what you've been thinking about uh, relative to uh, outcome-based uh, code provisions. Uh, we will have the recording of this webinar uh, available uh, probably at some point tomorrow uh, if you want to uh, go back or if you want to share it with your friends uh, and colleagues. Uh, again, certainly look forward uh, to your participation uh, in the IECC development process. Uh, and if you have any uh, additional questions, uh, certainly feel free uh, to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is provided here, uh, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. And uh, hope to see many of you in Kansas City. Thanks so much.